Welcome to my presentation. My name is Dr. Haroon Gadraj, Director of the Vein Care Centre. I'm going to talk to you about how to avoid and manage common problems related to sclerotherapy. And this is based on a presentation I gave to the Venus Forum at the Royal Society of Medicine in April 2013. It's pitched mainly at a medical audience, but members of the public might find it useful. Now, sclerotherapy is really very popular. It's grown in popularity in the United Kingdom over the last 10 years. And the reason is nearly any vein in the leg can be treated by sclerotherapy. For example, sclerotherapy is the treatment of choice for reticular veins and telangiectasia. It's been compared with other treatments such as electrical treatments and laser but sclerotherapy always comes out best. Foam sclerotherapy um, is comparable to standard surgery for major saphenous reflux and very few people now uh, need to be treated by surgical stripping. Sclerotherapy is also effective in treating tributary varicose veins, incompetent perforator veins of the legs, residual and recurrent veins after other interventions such as endovenous laser and radiofrequency ablation and it's also effective in the treatment of varicose veins of pelvic origin. So as I've said nearly any vein in the leg can be treated by sclerotherapy. It really is very versatile. The other reason why sclerotherapy is so popular is sclerotherapy is very safe. A large French registry of over 12,000 procedures uh, confirms a very low instance of major complications. And a clinical audit of foam sclerotherapy in over 7,000 patients from nine UK centres also confirms the safety of sclerotherapy, particularly in relation to stroke. Uh, and this was uh, published by the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in 2010. Now, there are complications from sclerotherapy and if patients are not selected well or if the treatment is given with poor technique, disasters can occur. And Cavese and Parsi in the Phlebology Journal in 2012 um, discussed and reviewed complications from sclerotherapy and they divided them into major complications and minor complications. And I'm going to consider the major complications first. The most feared uh, complication which is potentially life-threatening is of course anaphylaxis. Uh, this is an allergic reaction that can in severe cases result in death. Now it's very rare uh, there are only very isolated reports of severe anaphylaxis occurring after sclerotherapy. It's sporadic and it's unpredictable. Um, at, at present there is no test or marker which might indicate who will get an anaphylactic reaction from sclerotherapy and nearly any sclerosant, with the exception of hypertonic saline, could theoretically cause anaphylaxis. Thromboembolism, the development of a deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism uh, has been recorded with sclerotherapy. The incidence is low, um, many of the deep vein thromboses are silent and never, uh, never cause any harm, um, but again it's a potentially serious and potentially uh, life-threatening complication. Neurological events occur uh, after sclerotherapy. The most common is visual disturbance, which is always transient. There's never been a report of permanent visual damage after sclerotherapy, but it also has been associated with transient ischemic attacks, and there have been reports of stroke after uh, sclerotherapy. Tissue necrosis uh, can occur either locally, um, possibly because of extravasation. This appears to be more of an issue with liquid sclerosant, but obviously if sclerosant is injected into the artery, it can cause very uh, significant tissue loss. And there have been reports, in fact, of amputation being required after uh, intra-arterial injection. 
More recently, there's this phenomenon that's been described and recognized of veno arteriola reflex vasospasm. That is, uh, little arterioles near veins that are being injected can go into very intense spasm, so severe that the skin usually becomes very white and there can be associated skin loss. There have also been reports of nerve damage, both sensory nerve damage and motor nerve, nerve damage. And this appears to be a particular issue or a particular risk, though it's very rare, of course, uh, in the popliteal fossa behind the knee. Um, less common is swelling, edema, after sclerotherapy. This appears, again, it's very rare, but this appears to be an issue mainly after small saphenous vein sclerotherapy. It's associated with intense phlebitis, and um, it can sometimes be associated with poor bandaging or stocking fitting. So those are the major complications identified by Cavese and Parsi. More minor complications include telangiectic matting. This is the appearance of very fine new blood vessels in the skin near injection sites, and they can be very upsetting to the patient. They can um, mar a, an otherwise very good cosmetic result. They can occur, this telangiectic matting can occur after um, surgery as well, um, but it um, appears to be a problem after um, sclerotherapy. The incidence is probably in the order of uh, 10 to 20%. Uh, pigmentation can occur after um, sclerotherapy. Uh, I think some degree of pigmentation occurs in everyone, uh, but again, um, it uh, can mar a cosmetic result. And skin irritation is also another issue, either at the injection site or in relation to tapes or stockings. And uh, some blood, some uh, veins after they're injected develop clot within them and the retained coagulum can cause uh, irritation and in continued uh, inflammation at the injection site. And this is not so much a complication, but uh, in my experience, it's one that needs to be managed quite carefully. That's disappointment. Um, some people have very high expectations, uh, what can be achieved from their treatment. But it's very important that during the, co the uh, consultation, these uh, expectations are managed carefully. So those are the major and minor complications associated with uh, sclerotherapy. How do we avoid them? Well, as I've said, anaphylaxis is sporadic and rare. There's no test to identify who might get the problem. But I would suggest to you, uh, and you might think this reasonable, that if someone says they're allergic to a sclerosant, you wouldn't inject them. Of course, that's a, an absolute contraindication. Uh, to sclerotherapy. I also would suggest to you that if someone has uh, a number of allergies, they're very severely allergic to a number of various different things, perhaps if they've had an anaphylactic reaction to some other agent, you would, you would have caution. Thromboembolism, this is um, again a, a concern. If someone has a recent or acute deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, you would not wish to treat them with sclerotherapy. If they give you a history of a previous thromboembolism, if they have a known thrombophilia or they have an active cancer, that again might well be a contraindication to sclerotherapy. And if they have active acute superficial venous thrombosis, Again, this is a risk factor for deep vein thrombosis and sclerotherapy ought to be avoided in this group. Neurological events. Well, sclerotherapy is contraindicated in people who are known to have a symptomatic right to left shunt, particularly a patent foramen ovale. Now, um, right to left shunts and patent foramen ovale are associated with a, with gas embolism, paradoxical gas embolism. Um, there have never been any permanent neurological damage associated with paroxysmal gas embolism, but if you know that they have a right to left shunt, then you should avoid sclerotherapy in these patients. You should also exercise caution in people who are known to have migraine or who have had 
um, neurological events after previous sclerotherapy. There is a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, the volume of sclerosant is important. Neurological events become more frequent as the volume of sclerosant increases and a recent European consensus document suggests that sclerosants ought to be limited to 10 mils in one session. Interestingly, there is no evidence that carbon dioxide based foam reduces events. That's uh, uh, evidence from uh, Peterson and Goldman published in Phlebology in 2012. And there is no evidence that CO2 based foam or indeed a number of other manoeuvres such as elevating the legs, avoiding valsalva, compressing the sophenofemoral junctions also prevents paroxysmal gas embolism. Tissue necrosis, well obviously you want to avoid intra-arterial ejection by careful imaging and mapping of the veins. Um, I would suggest to you that an open needle technique or a cannula technique um, reduces the risk. I have no evidence for it, but it seems intuitive. If you can see the back flow of dark venous looking deoxygenated blood, and if that backflow is slow and non-pulsatile, as well as seeing the needle in the, knee, in the vein, this gives you added confidence that you're not injecting into an artery. You also need to inject slowly uh, under low pressure to prevent reflux arterial spasm. And if there's any pain or blanching of the skin, uh, you need to stop. Now we get blanching of reticular veins and telangiectasia, but if there is blanching of the skin rather than the blood vessels, then you may have this uh, reflux, reflex uh, vasospasm, which is associated with skin loss. Nerve damage. You obviously want to uh, carefully place your sclerosant in the vein. And I like to image the surrounding nerves. Um, I like to uh, cannulate and inject in transverse section. It is controversial. A lot of people are very skilled at injecting in longitudinal section, and I have no problem with that. Uh, but you need to be sure that you've got um, an idea of where the surrounding nerves are. Careful bandaging and padding in the popliteal region is very important. And your stockings need to be properly fitted and um, you need to avoid any uh, rucks or um, folds. Edema, again, careful bandaging and well-fitted stockings reduces this risk. And you need to use care with people who've already got edema and limit the extent of your sclerotherapy sessions. Um, we know that telangiectic matting can be uh, aggravated if there is persistent proximal reflux. Proximal reflux needs to be treated first, uh, and you need to consider using low volumes of appropriate strength sclerosant under low pressure. Pigmentation, I don't think you can avoid this. I think some degree of pigmentation is unavoidable. You can limit it, however, by using the lowest strength of sclerosant appropriate to the vessel, um, using good post-procedure compression, and releasing any retained coagulum as soon as possible. That limits the inflammation and limits the pigmentation that's partly melanin and partly um, extravasated um, red blood cells. I think there may also be a place for uh, topical steroids after injection to minimize uh, post-inflammatory pigmentation. Skin irritation and disappointment, you need to use, um, you need to be very careful in the use of tapes and bandaging, you use, need to use well-fitted stockings. Manage expectations carefully by um, consenting them appropriately and giving them lots of information. Um, I routinely use um, one application of topical steroid after injection sclerotherapy. I have no evidence for it, but it seems intuitive in reducing inflammation and irritation after the injection session. So in summary, uh, serious complications of sclerotherapy are very rare and most can be avoided by, patient care, by careful patient selection, very precise treatment imaging, making sure that the needle is in the vein uh, and injecting under ultrasound control. Minor complications are quite common, but fortunately they are usually uh, self-limiting. However, 
we know there's a general trend to increasing complaint and litigation and that's very um, it's very important that we uh, give plenty of information, manage expectations and consent our patients carefully before sclerotherapy. Anaphylaxis is uh, unpredictable and anyone providing sclerotherapy needs to be able to identify patients with anaphylaxis and manage it appropriately. Uh, and I think sclerotherapy should only be performed in an environment in which there's appropriate help and assistance uh, to provide resuscitation. In addition, for very rare and potentially life-threatening or limb-threatening complications, there need to be protocols and referral pathways uh, so that um, these problems can be dealt with appropriately and promptly. So thank you for uh, this, thank you for taking part in this presentation and watching. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you do, if you have, do subscribe to my YouTube channel that way you'll be able to see uh, my latest video and keep up to date with all my developments. Thank you.